Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring James Mason, Bobby Driscoll, and Nigel Bruce in Treasure Island. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. If there is anyone in our audience who has not already read Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, then I envy you tonight's experience of hearing this exciting adventure story for the first time. You'll make the acquaintance of one of the most famous characters in literature, that fascinating pirate, Long John Silver. And meet young Jim Hawkins, who lived an adventure such as all boys dream about. Treasure Island is also the first picture Walt Disney has produced without his cartoon characters. As the stars of this RKO release, we have James Mason, who I'm sure will now add Long John Silver to his list of fine characterizations. Bobby Driscoll, one of the top young artists of the screen, playing his original role. And that excellent British actor, Nigel Bruce. They all combine to bring Treasure Island vividly to life. And I'm sure all housewives will treasure the new Lux Flakes. You know, it's hard to believe that Lux could be improved in any way. But new Lux with color freshener is more than ever the favorite wardrobe care of Hollywood screen stars. The curtain rises on Treasure Island, starring James Mason as Long John Silver... Bobby Driscoll as Jim Hawkins, and Nigel Bruce as Squire Trelawney. I am leaving for London in the morning. They have convinced me, the Squire and Dr. Livesey, that my education is in sad need of repair, that it is time I thought of becoming a gentleman. I am not reluctant to go. It will be a new world and I will learn a great deal. But there is much I have already learned and the thought that I may forget the past, the high adventure of my boyhood, has urged me in the writing of this journal. On the one hand, it was a needless labor, for how shall I ever forget Long John Silver and the voyage of the Hispaniola? On the other hand, time has a way of clouding the past and it is a comfort to know that the whole story will always be here between the covers of this journal. The year was 1765, and then, as now, the Admiral Benbow Inn belonged to my mother. The wind still blows, the sea still crash, just as they did that late afternoon when the door opened and I saw a stranger on the threshold. Rum, boy. Glass double rum. Yes, sir. Rum, sir. Well, this is a quiet curve for certain. Which company mate? No, sir. Not much, sir. Now, who'd be the owner here? My mother. She, she's she gone into town, sir. Oh, you're all alone, eh? What's your name? Jim Hawkins, sir. And tell me, Jim, ever notice a seafaring man in this here grog shop? Name of Bones, mate. Captain William Bones. Bones, sir? No matter, boy, no matter. Just fill up the glass. He drank, threw me a coin, and left the inn. When I was sure he was gone, I dashed up the stairs. And then he asked for you, Captain. By name, sir. Captain William Bones. What sort of man, Jim? A one-legged man? No, sir. But he had a terrible scar. A scar on his face. Black dog. When you sees black dog, boy, you can be sure the man with the one leg ain't far off. Rum, Jim. Fetch me rum. But I can't, sir. I promised Dr. Livesey. Come on, boy. I said rum. But you know what he told you. He's... He said it would kill you. Rum for the blood, boy. I got to get me strength again. I dared not leave the inn, and yet I couldn't stand there watching the old captain die before my eyes. I'd have to go for Dr. Livesey. I ran to the door, but as I flung it open, a man loomed up before me. Before I could move, his fingers like iron closed on my wrist. Now then, boy, take me to Captain Billy Bones or I'll break your arm. The man was blind. In his free hand, he carried a knobby stick, lifted now as if ready to strike. I led him across the room, but Captain Bones scarcely raised his eyes. He just sat there as in a trance. This is Captain Bones, sir. 
It's a friend camera calling, Bill. It's Pew. Pew with a gift from your old shipmates. Blind Pew. He dropped a piece of paper on the table. Then he grinned and with no further word found his way alone out of the door. On the scrap of paper was a black spot and two words. Until dark, it says, Jim. The black spot until dark. But I I don't know what you mean. They won't get it out of me. What's right for mine is mine. Give me a hand, mate. We'll do that one-legged man yet. Help me, Jim. Back to my room. Help me. Shaking and gasping, he opened an old sea chest. Then with a knife, he slit the lining of the cover. From it, he took a map. He staggered back to the stairs, but he never reached them. Captain! I'm done in, Jim. Bring your boy. Yes, sir. Right away. Wait. Take the map. Keep the map. They may be back for it before you are, but not a word about it here. Yes, sir. Good boy. No mention of the map, and I'll go shares with you. Skip now, matey. And fast. It was dark when I returned to the inn with Squire Trelawney and Dr. Livesey. The place had been ransacked. We found Captain Bones on the stairs. He was dead. Well, Livesey, what's your verdict? He wasn't killed, Squire. He died of shock or rum. I wonder now what those rascals wanted of him. I I think I can tell you, sir. Now that he's dead, it it was this, sir. This was old Jim, it's a map. Odds my life, look what it says, Doctor. Flint's map. Flint? Flint the pirate? How'd you come by it, lad? He gave it to me, sir. He he said we'd share. Share what, Jim? Pirate treasure lives here. Flint's gold. Oh, come now, Why, sir. everybody knows of the ships that he plundered, but our departed friend seems to be the only one who knew where the treasure's been hid. So that's what the scoundrels wanted. The map of Flint's treasure island. Oh, you're a trump, young Hawkins. Mark my words, you will share. Listen to this, Jim. Spyglass Hill, it says... Bearing south, south, east to finger trunk tree, thence two cables south. Go on, go on, man, go on, go on, go on. There to larboard, due northeast to foot of white crag, ten paces east, chest of seven hundred thousand pounds. Bless my soul, bless my soul. Why, with favorable winds and a clue like this, we'll have Flint's gold within the year. And the two of you are coming with me. I'll fit out a ship, I'll. Oh, you speak for yourself, Troy. I have a practice. Hang your practice. Do you think I'd go to sea without a ship's doctor? And furthermore, you assume this map is authentic. <laughs> assume, do I? Then why were those ruffians here? And why is Captain Bones dead? Tell the truth, Livesey. <laughs> you're, you're frightened. <laughs> scared, scared as a rabbit. There's only one man I'm afraid of. Name the dog. Name him. You. You can't hold your tongue. Blast you. I'll be as silent as the grave. And I'm off to Bristol in the morning. You know, Jim, I believe he means it. I'll find a ship in Bristol, and then you and Jim can join me. You'll make a famous cabin boy, Jim. I'll see to that. Ah, his mother may have something to say about that. She'd listen to you, sir, if if she knew you were going. To be sure he's going. I'll wager my wig on it. Squire Trelawney kept his wig. I was still in a delirium of joy when I found myself many days later on the wharves of Bristol. At my side was Dr. Livesey, and standing before us with all the brass of the Lord Admiral himself, Squire Trelawney. Well, we're here, Squire. <laughs> Fools that we are. Look out there in the bay. Hmm? There she rides, gentlemen. A ship. You've got a ship. Three masts, square rigged, with the name Hispaniola. Hispaniola. Oh, she'll bring back all the pirate gold that we can put aboard her. No talk of treasure, I beg you, not in a public place. Oh, no, 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 be sure to have a mum's word, mum's word. Well, now, when do we go aboard? Well, you better ask Captain Smollett. Five days he's been selecting a crew. Oh, five days. Cautious, man. Outrageous, huh? When I threatened to step in, he told me to hire a sea cook. So, by job I did. A chef from Paris, I presume. Oh, none of your little jokes, live there. Fellow by the name of Long John Silver. I didn't waste good time poring over his credentials either. All I needed was the taste of his ham and, and his buttered eggs. That's his own tavern there over yonder. The Spyglass Inn. Follow us, lives in, and judge for yourself. It was then I had my first sight of Long John Silver, a great bulk of a man, brown and leathery from years at sea. But he did not walk as sailors walk. 
and I soon saw why. His right leg was gone. He walked in a peg with a crutch, and, and suddenly I heard the voice of Captain Bones again. What sort of man, Jim? Was it a one-legged man? But if my fears were immediate, they were as quickly dispelled in the cheery greeting and the friendly manner of Long John Silver. Top of the morning, gentlemen. Sit ye down, if you kindly will. For you, Squire Kidney Pie, piping out. And this be for Dr. Livesey. You, you know my name. Squire's told me that much about you two of you. It comes naturally, too. And this'll be young Master Hawkins. Yes, sir. Hawkins. Proper seafaring name it is. You, uh, you run your house well, my man. It isn't often I see fruit in a tavern. It's a rule of health, which same I learned while sailing under the immortal Stanley. God rest his soul. Do you hear that? Under Admiral Stanley. Aye, Your Honor. Quibber and Bay. You favor the Admiral yourself, Squire, <laughs> if I may say so. Why, you and Clem could make up your mind like that. Oh, do I know? I've noticed it before, too. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me none to hear you say, Heave up the anchor, lads. We sails on the hour. Yes, but you can't sail without a crew, Mr. Silver. Eh? Huh? You'd think there wasn't an honest seaman to be found in all Bristol. I beg to differ, sir, if I may make so bold. Why, there's a full cargo of my old shipmates becalmed right here in town. Sound men inside, Your Honor. If some was scarred in the services of England, and them win no pin pensions, neither. Could they be had at short notice, say, uh, 20 of them? Aye, sir. But they not be pretty enough for the modern taste, sir. And just what does that mean? It means, sir, that the beauty of their youth is faded in the giving of themselves to their king and country. Appearances be hanged. Bring in a crew come sundown, and I, for one... We'll be greatly obliged. Well, sir, I will say this, sir. I knows every seaman in these here parts like the palm of this hand. Excuse me, Mr. Silver. Aye, Master Hawkins. Did did you ever know Captain Billy Bones? Bones? Billy Bones? What ship did he sail on, matey? He he was a pirate, I think. Lord love ye, lad. Them as sailed with the Admiral had no speaking acquaintance with pirates. Aye, look at the lad, squire. And doctor, sir, the spitting image of myself when I was his age. Head full of pirates. But he'll find that the sea be mostly hard work, and the biggest satisfaction a man gets is doing his duty. And now, begging your pardon, sirs, I suggest you fill up while the victuals is still hot. And there was no doubt about it. Long John Silver was the finest cook who ever sailed the seas. When the meal was over, the squire was all for taking us aboard the Hispaniola. But Mr. Silver had a different thought. I've been thinking, Squire, could you spare me the services of Master Hawkins just for today, I mean? Oh, but what on earth do you... Uh... I've more on my hands, put in the in ship shape for the new owner, sir. And there's the crew you've asked me to... Oh, uh, to be sure. Stay here, Jim, and lend him a hand. But, but, sir... This way, Dr. Livesey. Don't worry, Jim. We'll be back for you before night. Now then, lad, suppose you comes with me into the galley. We can talk free there, each to the other. Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Why, that's a parrot in there. And an evil-minded bird she be. Belay, you old bumbles! Belay! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! I said belay! Dead men tell no tales! Swearing blue fire in front of a gentleman. Is is she yours? Aye, lad. Captain Flint, I calls her. Up to the famous buccaneer. T'was the pirates who taught her how to swear. If you want to know about pirates, Jim, ask Captain Flint. Only I'll wager as how you can't make her talk. Go on, lad. Try. Pirates, Captain Flint. Pieces pirates. Of eight. Pieces of eight. You ah! did it. You made a talk strike me, boy. Smart as paint ah! you be. Ah! Mr. Silver, Pieces look. They're out the window. Hi, lad. That man, they're on the key. Be, uh, be someone you know? Black Dog. He, he's a pirate. I know he is. Pirate? Tell me, matey. I'll call all hands and run him down. Hurry, please, don't let him get away. There'll be a pirate, the lad says. Do your duty, men. The men left the tap room. Through the window, I saw them hail Black Dog. He turned quickly and ran, the others after him. But I could not help thinking that, that they were letting him escape. He got away, lad. Too quick he was. A pirate, eh? What was he doing here? I, I, I don't know. Black Dog, eh? Black Dog, I'll Black Dog him. That... That's a pistol. Aye, and all loaded, matey. Here, feel the balance. Gee, it's, it's a fine pistol, Mr. Silver. Mind the trigger guard. Solid silver. Special made for Admiral Stanley, who gave it to me, rest him, 
for loyal and conspicuous service. Do you think you could shoot it? Oh, yes, sir. I might have known. Smart as paint, just like I said. Put the pistol in your pocket, boy. And if you clamps your lights on that there black dog, repel boarders. Yes, sir. You see, I knows a lad I can trust whilst I'm out doing my duty by the squire. You're leaving? And when I comes back, I'll have a crew and you'll have a sidearm. You mean to keep? That's my meaning, matey. Now, be we shipmates? Shipmates. It's a fine, bold shake of the hand you've got, Master Hawkins. Clear sailing, matey. He could move amazingly fast, wooden leg and all. And as I watched him striding down the street, I wondered if in all England there was another boy half so fortunate. Out in the harbour rode the good ship Hispaniola, our voyage, buried treasure, and Long John Silver was my friend. That afternoon, Dr. Livesey took me out to the ship, and then at sundown, Long John Silver came aboard. He had kept his word and brought a crew. Said, Squire, they paint pretty, but they knows the sea. Line up, chums, so he's on it can look you over. Right. Oh, they were an ugly lot, all right. Captain Smollett wanted no part of them. But the squire insisted, and every man of them was signed aboard. And then the captain asked the squire and Dr. Livesey to step into his cabin. I'll speak plain, gentlemen. I don't like this cruise, and I don't like the men. Well, possibly, sir, you don't like your employer either. We need trustworthy crew, not one recruited out of the muck by a ship's cook. The ship's cook was acting under my orders. And is the cook responsible for the ship's safety? Well, well, I, I must say... Uh, uh, Captain Smollett, we are all concerned with the ship's safety now. Now, what do you propose? The whereabouts of any treasure map to be kept strictly secret, even from myself and my mate, Mr. Arrow. The firearms... Removed from the forward hold and stored aft here. But surely you don't anticipate mutiny? Well, if I did, I wouldn't put out to sea at all. Ah. Well, Trelawney? Anything. It'll get us out to sea. Agreed, then. You'll find, gentlemen, that I'll do my duty. I can vouch also for Mr. Arrow, my mate, and the five men of the crew I had previously signed. And when can we sail? We should be ready by midnight. Oh, very well. Come along, Livesey. Hang it all, man. Why did, why did you take the fellow's part? Because I think our captain's a very conscientious man. Well, I find his conduct un-English. Downright un-English. That night, in the full of the moon, the sails of the Hispaniola bellied out to the wind. Our voyage had begun. I stood watching the lights of Bristol disappear, and then I was aware that someone stood behind me, and a hand clamped down on my shoulder. Look hard, Jim Hawkins. It's many a day afore you see Bristol Harbor again. And you'll see other sides, matey. Things you'll never forget so long as you be alive. In just a few moments, our stars will return with Act Two of Treasure Island. But first, listen. Listen to what Hollywood is saying. Marvelous. Sensational. It's perfect. Nothing like it. Joan Caulfield says... I could hardly believe my eyes. Claudette Colbert says... It's simply wonderful. Alexis Smith says... It's better than ever. It's sensational. It's new luxe. A better than ever luxe. New luxe with color freshener. The most thrilling improvement since Lux was invented. New Lux with Color Freshener is a real beauty bath for fabrics. It gives new life to all colors every time they're luxed. Hollywood screen stars, women everywhere, are saying it's a washing miracle. Smart prints are brighter and gayer, look glowingly alive. Wait till you see what it does for white things. They stay frosty white, dazzling white, whiter than you'd ever dream possible. All colors sparkle with new life and beauty every time you wash them. No other way of washing makes all your nice things look so fresh, so bright. So truly new. And this wonderful new Lux is mild and safe as ever. Now, more than ever, new Lux with color freshener is the favorite wardrobe care of Hollywood screen stars. The Lux in your neighborhood store right now is new Lux with color freshener. Get a big box tomorrow. Give all your nice washables that nice as new Lux look. Here's our producer, Mr. Keeley. Act two of Treasure Island, starring James Mason as Long John Silver... Bobby Driscoll as Jim Hawkins, and Nigel Bruce as Squire Trelawney. We 
been at sea for almost a month with that incident until one afternoon Captain Smollett had reason to call all hands on deck. Mr. Arrow, the mate, had found a pistol in one of the seamen. Since this is the first offence, I shall let it go unpunished. But let it happen again, and the penalty will be 15 lashes. True dismiss, Miss Arrow. If one man was guilty, I was no less so. But I had a friend to turn to, Long John Silver. So, so I'll have to turn in my pistol too, won't I? You know, yeah. It'd go hard with Long John if you was to turn it in now. But why? Well, here's a captain with a suspicious turn of mind, and here I am, handing out firearms to an able-bodied seaman like yourself. But I'd do no harm with it. Would you keep it out of sight? Oh, yes, always. And you ain't given to no rum drinking, neither, are you? Oh, no, sir. No quarrelsome, neither. So as my advice, Jim Hawkins, is keep the pistol in no art to nobody. Whatever you say, I'll do. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Fifteen lashes, just cause I wants to protect myself. A vast! It's time you learned George Merry just who is captain and who gives the orders. A captain it was. A captain wouldn't have that mite around sticking his nose into foxhole business. You lay a finger on Mr. Arrow and you'll answer to me, George. Personal. Mr. Arrow be a friend of Long John Silver. And I plans to take care of him. Be that clear to you, mates? <laughs> He'll obey you, John. Even before Mr. Arrow, I guess. Was you and me worth our salt, matey? We'd think out of a way to sweeten Mr. Arrow's disposition. Like, uh, something special for his supper. A plum pudding, maybe, for a cold, stormy night. Stormy night? She's clouding up, Jim. We'll rock proper come evening. Only plum duff bait no better than bilge water without rum. Can't you get rum for cooking? And have Captain suspect me of sneaking double grog? Then why don't I ask Squire for some? Without Captain knowing? I'm sure I could. Blow me down, you're a good and Jim. I seen that from the start. Get the rum, boy. Bring it below. We ran into weather that night just as Long John said we would. The crew and the forecastle were slow to change watch. Mr. Arrow came below to rouse them out. Stop it, watch on deck! Lightly no! Stop it, watch on deck! Mr. Arrow, could you spare me a moment, sir? Well, if you'll step in the galley, sir. Plum Duff. Made special for you, sir. I'm obliged, Mr. Silver. Then have your fill, sir. And this here bottle is what gives it its flavor. How full it is, so sweeten it, sir, to suit your taste. Aye, sir. To suit your taste. The bottle of rum was empty when Mr. Arrow went up on deck. By morning, the storm was over. It was Squire Trelawney who told me the news. A tragedy, Jim. A tragedy, a great tragedy. Squire, what happened? Mr. Arrow, last night in the storm, apparently he was washed overboard. The Hispaniola sailed on, and even I began to wonder if this long voyage would ever end. It was a sailor named Gray, one of the six recruited by Captain Smollett, who gave me hope. Ah, don't fret, boy. We'll sight land soon. The signs have come. What signs, Mr. Gray? For one thing, the crews turn quarrelsome. Then the beer's all gone, and water kegs crawling. Sure signs, boy, of a landfall. But there's still some apples left in the barrel. Well, when the last ones ate, We'll sight land for sure. Then I'm going below and eat them all. I went below to the apple barrel. It was a huge barrel, and being almost empty, I found I had to climb in to get at the few that were left. A moment later, I heard voices. The crew, and among them, Long John Silver. Hey, hey, you hey, got hey, 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 something to tell hey, us, hey, Mr. Hey, 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 well, what are your evil thoughts? We can take this ship right now. What are we waiting for? Aye, since me and Anne's joined you, the only ones on the captain's side is Gray and Joyce and Hunter. And I say cut their throats. And I say there'll be no killing till I gives the word. You're growing soft, John. When we was with Flint, you was all cut and ripped. You thick-headed swab. Who got rid of Arrow so quiet no one even suspected? Not even young Hawkins, who brought me the rum for the job. And who'll get you the firearms the same way when the time comes? All we want to know is what we're waiting for. We're waiting 
while a first-class navigator like Captain Smollett saves this here bum boat to our destination. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? Such being the case, you wait till I give the signal. Eatin' folks so grub while lemon cabins has meat and wine and rum. When a thirst be upon you, George Merry, bite into an apple real savage. I've a mind to chew one now, myself. There be the bear, old John, but you've got to reach for him now. You just drop a knife on one, Mr. Enns, and plucks it out. I heard his knife slip out of the sheath. I saw the blade poised over me, but it never descended. On deck, Mr. Gray had sighted land. Hey! I climbed, shaking, from the barrel and ran to Captain Smollett's cabin. To him, the squire, and Dr. Livesey, I told what I'd overheard. Long John Silver, I just can't believe it. I never questioned his loyalty. Captain Smollett, sir, I'm a fool. Uh, no more than I, squire. Well, it appears there are precious few of us now. I make it eight of us against twenty of them. But you forget Jim Hawkins, sir. Nine of us, then. Well, we have all the firearms. Can't we surprise them? That's my plan, once we get them all ashore. As I see it, they'll not make their move until we've found the treasure. Meanwhile, give them no cause for alarm. Jim, you've brought us this warning. I wonder, can you do it a second time? Could you keep your ears open, lad? Stay friends with Silver? Stay friends with... with him, sir? Well, can you, boy? Yes, sir. I'll stay friends with him. Good, lad. Well, I'd best call all hands and see about an anchorage. I've never seen that island before. No, then. Have any of you ever seen that island before? I yes, sir. I was cooked once on a trader as watered here. Do you remember the anchorage, Mr. Silver? Yonder, sir. There in that inlet. You give me a strong pull with the long boat, and I'll guide this ship in like a lamb. Good. Stand by to drop anchor in low on the boat. Any questions? If you please, sir. Could I go along with Mr. Silver? Well, Mr. Silver? I'd be that happy to take him, sir. Young Hawkins could try his hand on a tiller. Permission granted. You did well, Jim. Well, what did he mean about guiding the ship? The long boat will tow us into anchorage. Silver will need most of the crew to man the oars. Those that remain aboard ship will be our prisoners. Yes, but what if they rush us first? That squire's the chance we'll have to take. Find Silver Jim. Stay close to him, boy. And good luck. Yes, sir. An hour later, the longboat was in the water, pulling the Hispaniola closer and closer to the shore. Whenever I could, I looked behind, trying to catch a glimpse of what was going on on board. The man at the tiller, Master Hawkins, keeps his eye on the shore. Yes, sir. Send her ahead, John. Lift your oars. Drop your anchor, Captain, sir. This is your spot. I heard the splash of the anchor behind us, followed almost at once by shouts of warning from Captain Smollett. On your guard, men! The gold knife! What's he yelling about? That fool! That fool George Merry! Didn't wait for my signal. <laughs> We're in for it now, boys. Pull for the shore. Turn about and come alongside! Turn about and I'll shoot! With young Master Hawkins at my side! Fire that musket and I'll catch his throat. Harry, you blundering squid, can you hear me? I, I hear you. Them shots was just the war. Then lie low till the treaty be made. And this time follow orders. You dare to hold that boy? And I'll Begging you. your pardon, sir, I ain't finished with what I got to say. I'll give you one hour. To send a boat ashore with Flint's map and give yourself up to Mr. Murray. So be it if you want to see young Hawkins alive. Do what he says, Jim. We'll save you. Don't take it so hard, matey. Why, it's lucky you come along with old John here, or he'd have had nothing to bargain with. Let go of me. Why, well, even put my knife away. There now, see? Come back here, you. After him, you swabs. <laughs> I had jumped into the shallow water and struggled for shore. It was heavily wooded beyond the beach, but how long I could elude them, I didn't know. I could hear them crashing through the brush after me. But gradually, the sound of my pursuers grew distant. They'd gone inland, and later, a wisp of far-off smoke revealed they were making camp. 
As I turned for the shore, something sprang at me from the bushes. It was a figure out of a nightmare. I drew the pistol Silver had given me and... No! No! Don't shoot! Don't! I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am. You wouldn't harm poor Ben Gunn. Out of my terror, I saw a human being, scrawny, long-haired and bearded, his bones covered with pieces of tattered canvas. He was on his knees now, imploring me. It's just me. Poor old Ben Gunn, what hasn't spoke to a Christian these five years now. Five years? Were... Were you shipwrecked? Nay, mate, marooned. Tell me, that ship, would that be Flint's ship? No, Flint's dead. But I seen his men. I seen them come ashore. Some of them are Flint's men, but they got aboard by trickery. Aye, and is there among them a man with one leg? Long John Silver, and I hate him. Oh, he's come back. I'm as good as dead. It was him as marooned me. What be your tack now, young master? Well, if if you could help me row a longboat... Boat, says you. Ben Gunn's your man, says I. What might you call yourself, mate? Jim. Well, now, Jim, you just follow Ben Gunn. Not a sign of anyone on the beach, Squire. Not that I can see. Well, pray God the boy's still alive. What about the stockade at the end of the cove? It appears empty. Without arms, I'm sure those cutthroats went inland. Well, behind that stockade, we'd stand a chance of rescuing young Hawkins. Precisely. We'll leave two men aboard. There's no way our prisoners can reach the deck. Two men will suffice. We'll load the jolly boat with supplies and come back and forth to relieve the guards. Good. Then let's be at it. Stand by, Mr. Gray, to stock the jolly boat. Ben Gunn had led me to a cluster of rocks. Carefully hidden among them was a tiny boat. Made her with me, old hands, I did. Bamboo, Jim, and goat skins. At first, says I, we'll see if the ghosts be cleared of Flint's men. It was then we saw the jolly boat heading for shore. They were coming for me, I'd be saved. Coming ashore, says you. But what might that be, says I? There on the ship, look you, Jim. Men crawling out of the portals, climbing up to the deck. It was all too true. The prisoners trapped in folk in the folks were escaping through portals. There were a few shots and silence. Then from the mainmast I saw the skull and bones catching the breeze. Silver's men had taken over our ship. By now, our friends in the jolly boat had reached shore and rushed for the safety of the stockade. Meanwhile, Silver had led the men on shore back to the beach, back to the longboat, out of range of the stockade. Unmolested, they were making their way to the ship. Now they'll get the guns and the ammunition and the food. Everything but the map. Map? Says you what map? Never mind. Come along, Ben. No. My friends won't harm you. I promise. If your captain wants to see Ben gone, tell him to come tonight, alone. To the top of Spyglass Hill. And tell him this. Them as hides can find. And them as finds can hide. In the stockade, I was welcomed as one returned from the dead. I told them at once of my meeting with Ben Gunn. And what's your opinion, lad? Do you think this creature's sane? I... I think he is, Squire. Why would he want to, you to come after dark, Captain Smollett? Safety, of course. Mm. Right now, we may expect visitors ourselves. They're coming from the ship, Captain. Aye, the longboat's full of them. Can you load a gun, Jim? Yes, sir. I, I think so. Let them come, by Jove. They'll find us ready for them. They're silver, sir, with a flag of truce. Truce, eh? Take your positions, men. I'll see what he wants. Open the gate, Mr. Gray. Aye, sir. Now close it. And shoot with the first force move. Flag of truce, Captain, sir. Flag of truce. And what does that mean, Mr. Silver? Captain Silver, they come aboard, sir, and make terms. Captain Silver? Who's he? It's me, sir. Those poor lads yonder have chose me captain, sir, after your desertion of the ship. Stay on the cover, lads, and wait for me. Open the gate, Mr. Gray. You'll have patience, captain, sir, seeing as how I makes me way on but one pin and a crutch. Aye, a sweet, pretty place you have here, to be sure. And there's Jim. I'll be my little matey, eh? I have nothing to say to you. And squire and doctor. Well, sirs, the long and the short of it be this. I as the ship, I as the men, I as the armaments. Only what I ain't got be Flimp's map. So here be my terms. You give us that there map and you can keep your lives. 
We'll divide the stores and I gives you my affidavit to stop the first ship I sees and send it here to pick you up. Your word, Silver? And some of you couldn't ask for. Then here are my terms. If you come here one by one, unarmed, I'll trap you all in irons and take you home to stand fair trial. Well spoken, Captain Spollett. Now listen to me, John Silver. You can't find the treasure, you can't sail the ship, and your cowardly scum can't fight. So get out of here. Double quick. So be it, Captain. And Squire, so be it. But before an hour's out, you'll be begging help from me. And then what die will be the lucky ones. After a brief intermission, we'll resume with Act Three of Treasure Island. Tonight, I've chosen as our guest 12-year-old Catherine Beaumont because she is the voice of Alice in Walt Disney's delightful new Technicolor version of Lewis Carroll's classic, Alice in Wonderland. You posed for the artist, too, didn't you, Catherine? Yes, I did, Mr. Keeley, but you won't see me on the screen. I just serve as an inspiration to the artist. And a very lovely inspiration. You know, you're so much like the original Alice. You were also born in England, weren't you? Yes, and we lived there all during the war. You must have thoroughly enjoyed acting out the adventures of Alice in Wonderland. Oh, yes, it was great fun. I just can't wait to see the picture when it's released next summer. You know, Mr. Disney has drawn the characters just exactly the way I've always pictured the them. The Mad Hatter, the Queen of Hearts, the White Rabbit. Yes, they're all there in Alice's adventures, Mr. Keeley. And for me, well... Being Alice was, was like having a wonderful dream suddenly come true. A dream come true. That's the way screen stars feel about new Lux, Catherine. Lux with color freshener. It's the greatest improvement ever made in wonderful Lux flakes. Oh, Mummy uses Lux for all my things, Mr. Kennedy. Now do you know why those white pinafores of yours stay so beautifully white? And why your dresses stay so bright and gay every time they're washed? It's new Lux with color freshener. I say, can, can this new Lux do everything, Mr. Kennedy? Just about everything, Catherine. Lux has always been a marvelous product, but this new Lux is more wonderful than ever. White things stay white as the white rabbit. Prints as bright as the Queen of Hearts. All colors as bright and gay as the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. No other way of washing does so much for colors. Renews their sparkling beauty every time you wash them. Ladies, if you'd like an adventure that's exciting... Thrilling, yet absolutely safe, get a big box of New Lux with color freshener tomorrow. For white things, for prints, for all your colors, you'll say it's a washing miracle. Give all your washables that nice as new Lux look. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on Act Three of Treasure Island, starring James Mason as Long John Silver, Bobby Driscoll as Jim Hawkins, and Nigel Bruce as Squire Trelawney. Silver and his men attacked us immediately, but the stout logs of the stockade held, and we drove them off, though not without cost. Joyce, one of the loyal sailors, lay dead, and Captain Smollett wounded. Never before were we so grateful for Dr. Livesey. The captain's asleep. He'll be all right in a few days. Do, do you think they'll attack again tonight, sir? I you don't know, Jim. It's hard to foresee the end of this. Yes, it's true enough, lad. Therefore, I want you to have the treasure map. It's yours by rights, you know. If that's your wish, Squire. And if the worst comes to the worst, don't hesitate to buy your life with it. But they won't drive us out of here in a hurry. Well, they may not even try to, Squire. Well, what's that? Well, why not? Well, with a high tide, they can bring the ship in closer to shore. And once within cannon range, why, they could level oh, us. Oh, by Joe, so they could. If John Silver thinks of it, blast him. And they've got all the boats. Otherwise, I'd try to get to the ship and cut the anchor rope. But if we can't stay here in the stockade... Jim! Jim, you spoke of Ben Gunn and a meeting tonight. Perhaps he knows a place where we can hide. I'm sure he does, sir. I'm sure he does. Ah! I'll go looking for Mr. Gunn within the hour. 
I, too, had a plan. Under cover of darkness, I slipped unnoticed from the stockade and reached the rocks where Ben Gunn kept his little boat. In my belt was a knife. I paddled silently out of the Hispaniola, climbed to the deck, and cut the anchor rope. So it be you, young Master Hawkins. Come to join us, evil swabs, is it? It was Israel's hands. I struggled with every ounce of strength and broke away. But as I did, the map of Treasure Island fell from my shirt. Hence, map. So it was you what had it. I grabbed it from the deck and leaped for the rigging. I climbed higher and higher, but Hands was behind me. When I could go no further, I drew the pistol from my pocket. Stay where you are, Mr. Hands. You got a pistol, Master Hawkins. Go down to the deck. Just like Silver said, smartest paint. Coming here with me all alone on board. One more step, Mr. Hands, and, and I'll blow your brains out. No, no, matey. Suddenly he grabbed his knife and threw it. There was a great burst of pain as it pinned my shoulder to the mast but I pulled the trigger and the body of Israel Hands hurtled into the sea. I clung to the ropes and pulled out the knife, but for moments after I was unable to move. And then I saw that the tide was carrying the ship toward shore. Somehow I climbed down and made my way to the beach. Dr. Livesey. Squire, it's me, Jim. Open the gates. Please, Dr. Livesey. Strike me, it's matey. It's Jim. Silver. I must have fainted. When my senses returned, I was in the stockade. My friends were gone, and in their places stood Long John Silver and his cutthroats. But I made no move to let them know I could hear that talk. He'd been bleeding bad. Someone pinked him for certain. Save me from cutting his throat, a little swab. I've asked George Murray, stand clear. I've asked, is it? Maybe a touch of steel would show Master Arkins which side he were on, and some others I could name as well. Maybe you think you be captain here, eh, George? This here crew would lay a sight more confidence in a captain as allowed us our say about enemy prisoners. Why, you nutted? With him bad hurt, they'll part with the map to save his life. We'll hoist another flag of truce and hail that doctor. Before this crew takes any more of your orders, we claims our right of counsel. Aye, according to rule. According to the Then have your counsel and be hanged. Jim. Jim, can you hear me? Where's Dr. Lizzie and the squire? They give us the slip, lad, during the night. Now lay still. You'll be cared for proper. Old John will fetch the doctor here. And then, lacking a leg as he did, he climbed with great labor to the top of the stockade, hung a flag of truce, and shouted for Dr. Livesey. Don't fret, boy. They'll see that flag. And uh, speaking of seeing things, I've just been seeing something myself. The Hispaniola beached on the shore. That be your doing, Jim. That be the cause of your hurt. Yes, I cut the anchor rope. Tis a real wicked trick, Jim. And was I you, I'd keep my mouth shut about it. we finished council, Mr. Silver. This be for you. A piece of paper, is it? With a spot of black on it. And the word, deposed. Wrote very pretty, George. We're choosing a new captain, and do they vote me in? I'll see There'll be no voting until the treasure map be disposed of. Until then, the black spot ain't worth a biscuit. Map or no map, we ain't giving up no hostage till we lay hands on treasure. And I'll be here to find same without the map. Silver! It's him, the doctor. He's seen the flag. And I too, all of you. It's young Hawkins, sir. He be hurt. If Jim's there, bring him out of the stockade. If I set you out yonder, Jim... Do you give me your affidavit not to slip cable? Yes, word of honor. Stand by while I police. And a sharp lookout on all sides. My eyes be on a man what's trying to get a foot in each camp. And him with only one leg. We met some 50 yards from the stockade. As gently as he could, the doctor dressed my wound. Taken to knifing boys, eh, Silver? Not me, sir. Why, if it hadn't been for long, John, he'd have had his throat cut. He got aboard that Hispaniola, sir. Which same he's gone and beached. He's what? Last Jim. night. Yes. Even so, when I find the lad, half dead he be, I says to myself, John, you've got to save that dear boy. Oh, so Captain Silver wants to join us again. Yep. Hmm? 
I'll be honest and open with you as I always am. I do. I thinks gold dust of this dear boy. Took to him like bitch I did. You'd have killed me yourself if you'd have had the map. But you'll never get it. I'll die first. But I got the map, Jim. Be this the same or be it not. Doctor, he's got it. Last night when I picked you up outside the fort, there the map be in your shirt. But old John ain't human, he ain't. He didn't care about saving his little mate's life. All he wanted was this ear map. And what good's a treasure without a ship to haul it? And what good be a ship, sir, if only to haul me to the hangman? Now, was I to further preserve young Hawkins' life? Do you think you could save mine? You can save Jim. I could guard the boy from them there scum. But they'll not give up till they seize the treasure, Doug. Hmm. I want to speak with the boy alone. Speak and be welcome. I'll send off. Jim. Jim, I don't know how you managed to save us that ship. But I lost the map. Ah, your safety is far more important. Now listen. I'll make a quick break to draw their fire. And then before they have time to reload, start running for the woods. The woods, sir? Yes, we're with Ben Gunn. He knows a dozen hiding places. No. No, I can't. I gave Long John my word. They would have killed me. They would have killed me long before it hadn't been for him. But Jim, don't... Yes, perhaps you're right. All right, Silver? Aye, sir. Now you stay close to this boy. If we get out alive, I'll do my best to save you. You couldn't say more, was you my own mother? No, heaven forbid. Good luck, Jim. Back in the stockade, Long John Silver told the men he had just got the map from Dr. Livesey. <laughs> and now, boy, Sunder, I will resign. Elect anyone you please to be your captain. I'm done with you. At once, the treasure hunt was underway. They followed the map with unholy care, and in a frenzy, they started to dig, clawing at the ground like animals. In a matter of minutes, they struck the chest. Wild-eyed and gasping, they heaved it to the surface and broke it open. <laughs> Empty. It's gone. Treasure's gone. Stand by for trouble, Jim. Look, one dirty guinea and that's all. There's your 700,000 pounds, Mr. Silver. Hardly worth dividing, is it, Joe? So you did make a bargain with the doctor. They've been here first. Look at his face, mate. You can see it in his face. Kill him. He sold us out. I'm one against the lot of you. But I got two pistols and the first one who... <laughs> Long John Silver had fired only once. The other shots came from Dr. Livesey, the Squire, Mr. Gray, and Ben Gunn. Unprepared for this sudden attack, the pirates were now our prisoners. Ben Gunn! To think it was you what done me. How <laughs> do, Mr. Silver? Pretty well, I thank you. What happened to Flint's gold, says you? Ben Gunn's cave, says I. Cave? What cave? That's true enough, Jim. That's where we've been these many hours. It's all there, lad. A treasure beyond dreams. Save one dirty guinea. So it was, just as the squire said, treasure beyond dreams. First came the task of taking our prisoners to the Hispaniola, then the matter of loading the treasure, and after that, back to shore for Long John Silver. I'll be thinking, Captain Smollett, as to how you'll ever clear the vessel and get her out to sea again. I tied in a stretch of canvas and she'll float off whenever we've a mind. Yes, and that brings us to your fate, Mr. Silver. I stand as ever, sir, ready to do me duty. And happy I am to think I had some small hand in saving young Master Hawkins. And does that clear you of the crime of mutiny? Please, Squire, he did save my life. Then, my boy, you're free to testify on his behalf. He'll have a fair trial in Bristol. And now, Captain, I'll take this scoundrel back to the ship and clap him in arms. But not alone, Squire. Mr. Gray, you and Jim, take them in the longboat. Not a move out of you, Silver. Only your monkey shines, mind you. Would you permit a word, sir, with mighty? Talk your fool head off for all I care. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you kindly, sir. Jim, lad. I'm thinking of Captain Flint, I am. She be still in the stockade. 
Will you take the parrot boy? Only remember she can't abide a cage. None of us likes cages, Jim. I... I couldn't, Long John. You'd be fond of the bird, ain't you? I'd like to keep her. But she'd only remind me of you. Well, no matter. Though I would dearly love to leave a trinket to her, to a lad I respect. Keep your hands in plain sight, Mr. Silver. Me answer? They'd just be patting the boy, sir. Oh, even so, I... Look out! He's got my pistol! Put that down! Put that gun down! Put it down! Patting him, I was, sir, and what should I come up with but this? Now, drop your oars! Into the water, Mr. Gray! Jump and swim for it, you too, Squire! Confound you! I'll have you hanged on the ship! If I may make so bold, sir, I'm borrowing this long boat. So, over you go! Oh, you... you monster! How, how can I swim to shore? Just spread your blubber, Squire. Might be as you can float. As for you, Jim... I'll jump. You don't have to tell me what to do. Belay now. I can't row and steer both. So I'm asking you to set me a true course through the channel and I'll put you off on yon piece of rock. And if I don't... It's the last thing I'll ever ask of you, matey. I took the tiller. I sat in silence as he rowed desperately. It was a narrow channel. Finally, I saw my chance. I yanked the tiller and drove the boat into a sandbar. You put us on a bar. Climb over and shove me off. I'll take no orders from you. And you can't do it yourself, can you? Not with one leg. You put me on here and now you'll shove me off. Or by the powers, I'll crack your neck. They're coming after me in the jolly boat. And they'll take you and they'll hang you for your crimes. I'll take you to Bristol and... They can't. They can't hang you, John. Jim. Jim, boy. Jim. That's it, lad. Shove her nose out. I must have known you'd never let him hang your own shipmates. I'll hoist a bit of sail out yonder. I'll make it safe enough. Goodbye, matey. Good luck to you. <laughs> He was well out in open water when the squire and Dr. Livesey reached the sandbar. He, he got away, squire. Oh, well, the sharks may do for him yet. Blast him anyway. I'm as wet as a herring. Blast him indeed, squire. And yet I can almost find it in my heart to hope that he makes it. He will, sir. I know he will. Before our stars return for their curtain calls, here's Libby Collins with the movie news of the week. News about two premieres. First, one of the most important Hollywood premieres in recent years. Tomorrow night, 20th Century Fox will open the Mudlark at the Chinese Theater for the benefit of one of Irene Dunn's favorite charities. An opening that will mean new laurels for Irene. Yes, indeed. It took a lot of courage to play England's beloved Queen Victoria with an all-British cast. And she won them completely. From all over England, they sent her little souvenirs of Victoria. The entire action in the mudlark takes place in one day, doesn't it? Uh Uh-huh. An adventurous urchin induces the widowed Victoria to break 15 years of seclusion. Uh, That must have simplified Irene's costume. Well, yes and no. The white touches for which Victoria was famous had to be kept spotless. Now, you know, keeping whites really white used to be almost as difficult as keeping colors bright. But not anymore. This month, Hollywood and smart women everywhere are flocking to another premiere. New Lux with Color Freshener. That marvelous new Lux that keeps whites purest white. Gay prints and colors brighter than you ever dreamed possible. It's a real beauty bath for colors. Irene Dunn has been a Lux fan for years. And she says this new Lux is more marvelous than ever. Why, it leaves even delicate lingerie shades so ravishingly lovely she can hardly believe they aren't brand new. Now, more than ever, screen stars insist on new Lux with color freshener for all their personal things. It renews all the sparkling beauty of lovely slips and nighties, dresses and blouses, every time you wash them. And it's mild and safe as ever. New Lux with color freshener is in your store now. Get a big box tomorrow. Give all your washables that nice as new Lux look. Now, here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. Many thanks to our stars for recreating one of our favorite stories. And here they are, James Mason, Bobby Driscoll, and Nigel Bruce. (laughs) 
Bobby, you've appeared in Walt Disney's pictures before, haven't you? Oh, yes, but I didn't like playing in them as well as Treasure Island. Why was that, Bobby? Well, they had animals in them. You know what scene stealers they are. Oh, yes, we know all about little scene stealers, don't we, Nigel? <laughs> sure, we do. <laughs> you know, Bobby, I first played Squire Trelawney in 1934. Mm. It's a great story of England, Treasure Island. Uh, tell me, Bobby, how did you like England where you, where you made the picture? Oh, just fine, Mr. Bruce. It was quite an experience. And how about the Lux Radio Theater? Did you enjoy playing here, the rehearsals and all? Oh, just fine. Except in England, after the rehearsals, we always had tea. Well, here, Bobby, we all have Lux flags. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a much nicer arrangement, don't you? You know, you're becoming quite Americanized, James. I understand that you've named your new picture company after one of their cities, a uh, uh, Portland Pictures, isn't it? Yes, Nigel, well, it's indirectly, yes. It's really named after my young daughter, Portland, who is named after her godmother, Portland Hoffer, who in turn is named after Portland, Oregon. <laughs> It's a little confusing, isn't it? Well, it is a bit, old man. <laughs> Incidentally, our first picture production is A Lady Possessed, adapted from my wife's best-selling novel. You certainly have a talented family, Mr. Mason. Well, now, you're pretty talented yourself, Bobby. Acting, athletic. And don't forget, I'm a Boy Scout. I was one once, Bobby. Oh? About, uh, about 80 years ago. <laughs> Bill, I understand that next week your play is a romantic comedy. Yes, James, it's that entrancing one from Universal International Studios... Louisa. And as our stars from the original cast, we will have Ronald Reagan, Ruth Hussey, Charles Coburn, Edmund Gwen, Spring Byington, and Piper Laurie. What a cast. We'll be listening. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night. and happy treasure hunting. Here's the bargain of the year. A pair of all-purpose kitchen shears for only 50 cents. Now, during Lever Brothers' star value sale. These sturdy shears are actually worth $1.25, but they're yours for only 50 cents and two wrappers from Lux Toilet Soap. You'll find dozens of uses for these heavy-duty shears. They're wonderful for cutting cardboard, twine, fabrics, and flower stems. For cleaning and boning fish, cutting up chickens, even opening bottles and cracking nuts. They'll last for years... And you can have them for only 50 cents, plus two wrappers from Lux Toilet Soap. Send coin and wrappers with your name and address to Shears, Box 16, New York 46, New York. Order several pairs. They make grand shower gifts, marvelous bridge prizes. I'll repeat that address. Shears, Box 16, New York 46, New York. For every pair ordered, send 50 cents with two wrappers from Lux Toilet Soap. This offer expires March 31st. Send for your all-purpose kitchen shears today. Viva Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ronald Reagan, Ruth Hussey, Charles Coburn, Edmund Gwen, Spring Byington, and Piper Laurie in Louisa. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, may we remind you that United States savings bonds are still your best investment. They're both safe and profitable, and you can buy them easily through your payroll savings plan. You'll be helping both yourself and your country when you buy United States savings bonds. Treasure Island was presented and Bobby Driscoll appeared by special arrangement with Walt Disney. Heard in our cast tonight were Charles Davis as the narrator, Ben Wright as Dr. Livesey, and Bill Johnstone as the captain. And Herbert Butterfield... Bill Conrad, Jay Novello, Eric Snowden, Ed Max, Norman Field, Lou Krugman, Eddie Marr, and Dorothy Lloyd. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Louisa, starring Ronald Reagan, Ruth Hussey, Charles Coburn, Edmund Gwen, Spring Byington, and Piper Laurie. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.